Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. We are actually about to finish up Module C, believe it or not. We left off Part 1 of Lecture 13 with the end of the Spanish-American War and U.S. expansion out of North America taking particular notice of the fact that the U.S. did not release the Philippines to Filipinos. We had also covered up through McKinley's first term as president, and over a few past lectures, we've seen Teddy Roosevelt and his carefully crafted belligerent tough guy image. In 1900, McKinley ran for president again, and this time Teddy Roosevelt, in his very direct reach for political power, ran as the vice presidential candidate. The white middle class liked Teddy Roosevelt and his frontier tough guy image. On the slide, you see a campaign poster for the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket. And it says down here, the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. And up here, this little cap is the cap of liber liberty popularized during the French Revolution. And then you can see they say, gone democratic and the factories are idle and the plow is just sitting there and then gone Republican and everybody's working. And then gone democratic is run on the bank, that's the panics. And then gone Republican is run to the bank, meaning people have money to put into the bank. And then the last one, Spanish rule in Cuba and American rule in Cuba. McKinley had been fortunate that there were no major bank scares in his first term. You will also notice that Cuba is on this poster and supposedly under American rule, despite the Teller Amendment, but the Philippines are not shown here. When the United States and Spain went to war over Cuba, the Filipinos, who had already been fighting against Spain, joined the side of the U.S. The Filipinos believed that a U.S. defeat of Spain would lead to a free Philippines. They chose a president, Emilio Aguinaldo, and wrote a constitution modeled after the U.S. Constitution. On June 12, 1898, Aguinaldo declared the independence of the Philippine Islands, and in January of 1899, he officially became the president, except there was a problem. The U.S. refused to recognize the new government of the Philippines. Outraged by the betrayal, the Philippine Republic declared war on the United States. The war was brutal on both sides, but the Filipinos suffered by Far the heavier losses. By the end of the Philippine War in 1902, 4,000 American soldiers were dead as compared to Filipino losses of more than 40,000 Filipino people, and many sources put civilian casualties into the hundreds of thousands. Emilio Aguinaldo was captured by the U.S. military in 1901 and forced to declare allegiance to the United States. From that point, Aguinaldo wore a black bow in public. You can see his black bow tie here to mourn his lost republic. On July 4th, 1946, well after the Module C time period, the United States granted the Philippines its independence. Aguinaldo was still alive and removed his black bow. At the time of the 1900 U.S. presidential election with McKinley and Roosevelt running, the bloody ongoing war in the Philippines did not make good campaign images for McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt. William Jennings Bryan ran against McKinley again. Bryan came out against U.S. imperialism, especially in the Philippines. McKinley ran on the fact that there hadn't been any huge economic busts under his presidency. McKinley and Roosevelt won. Following his re-election, McKinley sent William Howard Taft, whom we will come to meet again in a bit, to head a special commission to the Philippines. 
I am giving you this rather low quality picture of Taft with other Americans, including his wife. I'm not sure which one she is. And with Filipino children, because it shows the same patronizing attitude taken with Native Americans and industrial labor. The source that I got this from treats this photo as an example of American beneficence in providing American education for Filipino children. I will just remind you of the American Indian boarding schools that we talked about some time ago. I've juxtaposed the photo to the absolutely horrifying political cartoon from the era because it illustrates so well that the U.S. treated all Filipinos, including all adults, as incontinent children. Taft oversaw the issuance of 499 laws to control the Philippine population. His group censored Filipino media and imprisoned dissidents. The U.S. government could not understand why the people of the Philippines were not just grateful for American schools, roads, and tax systems. Returning to the U.S. executive branch, McKinley's second term did not last long. In 1901, he was killed by a young man who, conveniently enough for the anti-immigration crowd, called himself an anarchist and had a foreign-looking last name, despite being a New York-born factory worker who had been fired and blacklisted for striking. McKinley's death meant that his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, became president for most of that term. We've already seen that T. Roosevelt was great at crafting an image for himself. And once he was president, he cast himself as a man of the people. He presented himself as controlling big business. But these people, the corporation owners, they were his social group. Inasmuch as T. Roosevelt practiced top-down progressivism, which is a contradiction in terms given the way that we've been considering progressivism, what T. Roosevelt really went after and got was an increase in presidential power including over big business, and an increase in personal power, including over people who were socially actually a little bit higher up on the status ladder than he was. Nevertheless, T. Roosevelt was genuinely skilled at engineering his image and the optics of public perception. In the 1904 election, he trounced the Democratic challenger everywhere except in the solid South. Let's take a look at what Roosevelt did and what he did not do. Roosevelt did absolutely nothing to combat Jim Crow in the South or anti-Chinese sentiment in the West. In fact, he was an unabashed, outright racist and believer in the superiority of folks classified as white and who spoke English. When it came to war, I let Teddy Roosevelt speak for himself, and I will do that here as well. The issue was not finding these quotes, but choosing a subset of available quotes to share here. I know the print is small, so I will read them. Teddy Roosevelt, in his own words, writing about war with Native Americans, he said, the most righteous of all wars is a war with savages, though it is apt to be also the most terrible and inhuman. A sad and evil feature of such warfare is that whites, the representatives of civilization, speedily sink almost to the level of their barbarous foes. On the annexation of Texas in 1845, Roosevelt had said, it was, of course, ultimately to the great advantage of civilization that the Anglo-American should supplant the Indo-Spaniard. On slavery, T. Roosevelt said, I know what a good side there was to slavery. Now, that that just, I always have to stop right there, but it continues. But I also know what a hideous side there was to it. And this is the important side. You kind of feel like he's trying to convince himself there. On African Americans, T. Roosevelt said, I do not believe that the average Negro in the United States is as yet in any way fit to take care of himself and others as the average white man. For if he were, there would be no Negro problem, as if Black people had 
I don't know, enslaved themselves and kept themselves from voting. And yeah, on English colonialism, Roosevelt said, this would be T. Roosevelt, there will be another Roosevelt president later. T. Roosevelt said, I am a believer in the fact that it is for the good of the world that the English speaking race in all its branches, that means Americans too, should hold as much of the world's surface as possible. The spread of the little kingdom of Wessex, that's a reference to England and Anglo-Saxon construction of whiteness. Anyway, the little kingdom of Wessex into more than a country, more than an empire, into a race which has conquered half the earth and holds a quarter of it is perhaps the greatest fact in all of history. T. Roosevelt considered himself a historian. Now, T. Roosevelt did support individual Black people. For example, he defended Minnie Cox there on the left, the country's first African-American female postmaster, after she was driven out of Indianola, Mississippi, because of the color of her skin. T. Re Roosevelt appointed a few Black Americans to government positions, such as his nomination of Dr. William Crum on the right, as customs collector in Charleston, South Carolina, which drew considerable political opposition. T. Roosevelt also said, I cannot consent to take the position that the door of hope, the door of opportunity, is to be shut upon any man, no matter how worthy, purely upon the grounds of his race or color which sounds kind of nice, until you realize that he viewed these individuals as exceptions and was still willing to denigrate an entire population of Americans purely upon grounds of race or color. I give you another T. Roosevelt quote. The great majority of Negroes in the South are wholly unfit for the suffrage. That means he was okay with them not being allowed to vote. T. Roosevelt, like large portions of the white educated elite, went all in on eugenics. The term eugenics, coined in 1883, says exactly what it was supposed to mean. You, the first part, means good. Genos is birth. So eugenics literally means well-born or well-bred. Europeans and Americans had been big believers in breeding better, meaning more useful or appealing to the breeders, versions of plants and animals since the Enlightenment. The basic claim that eugenicists made was that thoroughbred humans could be created like thoroughbred horses. But breeding of that kind requires controlled reproduction. Who can breed with whom, who can and cannot breed at all? And even most Victorians and their followers were reluctant to push that to its logical conclusion in humans, although they did actually do so in some cases. Eugenics arose from and legitimated the idea that some people were better than others. Some lives were more important than others. Theodore Roosevelt met greater demands for women's rights and autonomy with increasing backlash grounded in eugenics. Roosevelt tapped into an idea already growing among white populations by the end of the 19th century called race suicide. Yes, literally, it's called that. The birth rate actually dropped for all American women over the course of the 19th century. It also dropped for college-educated men, but they were not perceived as the problem. The race suicide idea rose in part from the fear of the elite class that they would not be able to pass on their large fortunes or political power. White men like T. Roosevelt complained that births among women of color were somehow increasing, despite statistics to the contrary. And he felt that white women, he and his group felt that white women were wasting too much energy on education 
and not enough on making babies. Literally, I will let T. Roosevelt speak for himself again. He makes life easy for me. All the other problems before us in this country, important though they may be, are as nothing compared with the problem of the diminishing birth rate and all that it implies. And what he means is diminishing white birth rate, and what it implies is that white people may not remain masters of the universe. Another quote, the higher orders of every society tend to die out. There is a tendency on the whole for both lower classes and lower civilizations to increase faster than the higher. I have no idea what data he thought he had for that, but that was his feeling. This idea of race suicide worked well with the cult of true womanhood as it kept women at all levels of society economically dependent on men. Theodore Roosevelt spoke for many upper class or upper class hopeful men when he condemned the trend toward lower birth rates and smaller families among the white educated classes as decadent and a sign of moral disease. Roosevelt directed his greatest criticisms at white women, saying that anyone who avoided having children was a, quote, criminal against the race, and that such women were, again, quote, the object of contemptuous abhorrence. The invocation of race suicide grew from fears not only of losing the privilege of whiteness, but the intertwined privileges of sex and class as well. Again, T. Roosevelt practically says most of this outright, quote, Willful sterility is, from the standpoint of the nation, from the standpoint of the human race, the one sin for which the penalty is national death, race death. Another quote, the first requirement in a healthy race is that a woman, read that as white woman, should be willing and able to bear children just as the men must be willing and able to work and fight. And I have put several postcards on the slide referring to race suicide and in at least one case crediting Roosevelt himself. When you hear that T. Roosevelt supported woman suffrage, which he ostensibly did, you might consider his reasoning given his ideas on race and civilization. Remember that part of the white woman's suffrage movement justified giving women the vote to drown out the votes of those considered inferior. T. Roosevelt's ideas of civilization shaped his foreign as well as domestic policy. Not only did the U.S. hold on to the Philippines, T. Roosevelt justified doing so as being for the good of the Filipino people. When questioned by the U.S. Congress in 1901, T. Roosevelt said, quote, What has taken 30 generations to achieve? We cannot expect to see another race accomplished out of hand, especially when large portions of that race start very far behind the point which our ancestors had reached even 30 generations ago. I apologize for the cartoon on the slide. As for the earlier one with Uncle Sam holding an infant Philippines. But throughout the quarter, I have been stressing the point that treating any group as if they were all children is absolutely a way of justifying power. As the industry titans did with their employers and as slaveholders did with enslaved people. Images like you see on the screen and like the other one were ubiquitous, and T. Roosevelt had no problem with it. We looked at the Pacific and talked about U.S. imperial expansion earlier with the Spanish-American War. Moving forward to 1904, we can see that the U.S. has annexed Hawaii at this point. The U.S. also has several small but strategically positioned islands. Midway, Wake, and Guam. And I will explain what I mean by strategically positioned as we go along. The U.S. and Germany have split Samoa between them, and the U.S. has enough control over the Philippines to claim them, and more to the point to base merchant 
and military ships there. This was strategic, and I've mentioned before that competing navies in the Pacific were bent on controlling trade with China, and now I will add Korea to that. Zooming in a bit here, so still 1904, there were six big navies trying to either control trade or outright colonize regions of the West Pacific at this time. Great Britain had the world's biggest navy, and it had the biggest empire at that point. You can see all of the pink for Great Britain, including what is labeled the Indian Empire or the British Raj. By the first decades of the 20th century, Great Britain was more concerned with keeping and administering the empire they had than adding much more, although you can see them making incursions up here into Tibet. When it came to China, Britain wanted to control trade there, but not take full responsibility for administering all of that territory and the people in it. France had an established navy, but they were not the British Empire. Although you can see French Indochina down here, that is Vietnam. Germany had an increasing navy, and we've seen conflict with the U.S. over Samoa as Germany tried to collect colonies. Mainly for resource extraction in Asia, the Germans were also moving into Africa at that time, but we will save that story for another time. The Russian Empire, so we've zoomed again on that same region, the Russian Empire had had a navy for a while. And unlike Britain, they were absolutely interested in the complete takeover, not only of some larger Western Pacific islands, but of China. Here, the Russian purple has overrun Manchuria, and it is looming over Korea. The Japanese Navy was growing powerful quickly, and Japan took on Russia for control of East Asia. This became the Russo-Japanese War, and you can see Japan's attack on Port Arthur here. Europeans and many Americans were shocked when Japan's navy defeated Russia's. Although the war between the two ambitious empires wore down both countries' navies and treasuries. And you can see the growing navy of the U.S. circling in now that we are closer to Midway and Wake Islands. You can just see the tip of the Philippines in the southwest corner here and the tip of Alaska in the Northeast. Those six countries, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Japan, and the U.S., formed various on-again, off-again treaties and alliances with one another in an effort to control this region. I have found that my own experience of learning about World War I has been along the lines of, oh yeah, Japan was in World War I, but let's go back to Europe. For me, at least, this has not done a great job of setting up complicated dynamics in the Western Pacific region that would show up in American policy and interactions here over the entire arc of time from World War I through World War II and on to the Vietnam War. I am just finding my way around that material, so I have given you in the mini module coming up two chapters by a Dutch historian that goes through the various intrigues with the U.S. as just one player and not the entire story. I've zoomed in more <laughs> to the South in the 1904 map to show why a Dutch historian would be particularly well-equipped to cover this. You can see the proximity of the Dutch East Indies at the time, as they were called at the time, to English holdings in pink, including Australia down here, the Americans in the Philippines, and Japan in Taiwan. I advise gutting the chapters I've given you to get an idea of political complications leading into World War I in the Pacific, but do not get bogged down completely in who allied with whom when exactly, unless that is of particular interest to you beyond this class. Pulling together our strands here, 
Japan had won naval victories against Russia, but both Russia and Japan were low on fighting resources and were ready to take a break. Meanwhile, T. Roosevelt had already expressed in his inimitable way a low opinion of the Russians. I haven't put this quote on the slide, but here it is, T. Roosevelt on the Russians. No human beings, black, yellow, or white, could be quite as untruthful, as insincere, as arrogant, in short, as untrustworthy in every way as the Russians. On the other hand, amazingly, he did respect the Japanese. Quote, they are a wonderful and civilized people entitled to stand on an absolute equality with all the other peoples of the civilized world. I will add, that is what a powerful navy will get you. And T. Roosevelt was a bit concerned that Japan might not only start eyeing the Philippines, but might actually be able to take at least part of them. T. Roosevelt sent Taft, whom you may remember overseeing the Philippines, but who was now U.S. Secretary of War, U.S. War Secretary, to Japan, where Taft met with Taro Katsura, who represented the Japanese government. This was a behind-the-scenes, not official meeting. But we remember that T. Roosevelt approached corporations that way, so why not naval powers as well? The memorandum summarizing what the two representatives had discussed, the Taft Katsura memorandum, was long and worded somewhat obliquely. I've only given you the second page of it here. But the gist of it was that the U.S. would not get in the way of Japan's goals in Korea if Japan would respect U.S. ownership or presence in the Philippines. T. Roosevelt cabled back, saying, Your conversation with Count Katsura absolutely correct in every respect. Wish you could state to Katsura that I confirm every word you have said. The reason that the document you see on the left here has the date 1924 on the top is because the entire agreement was off the record and not revealed to the American public until it was discovered by an historian in the 1920s. Apparently, there is still some discussion among specialist historians of whether the taft katsura T. Roosevelt conversation was a big deal or not. However, that is parsed. T. Roosevelt brokered the treaty ending the Russo-Japanese War in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1905. As you can see on the map, the treaty ended up giving Japan control of Korea and parts of southern Manchuria, including Port Arthur that they had attacked earlier and the railway that connected that with the rest of the region. And Japan also got Sakhalin Island. Meanwhile, immigration of Japanese agricultural workers to the west coast of the U.S. had increased, filling spaces from which the Chinese were now excluded, as we've studied. This influx of Japanese working-class immigrants met with increasing opposition in California, and a movement among white Americans to segregate Japanese children into separate schools which was insulting to Japan, not just to the people who came over. Trying to appease Californians while also staying on the good side of the rising world power of Japan, T. Roosevelt did one of his not quite official handshake deals with Japan. The Japanese government agreed to sharply restrict the movement of Japanese citizens, particularly laborers, to the U.S. as long as Japanese American children could continue to attend integrated schools on the West Coast. Unlike the Chinese, however, Japanese American men, especially those with enough money from business, could bring wives, parents, and children. This meant that the Japanese-American population was more gender-balanced than the Chinese and continued to grow through natural increase, meaning having kids. This eventually led to more pressure from white Americans to end all 
Japanese immigration and, as if that weren't enough, to diminish rights for Japanese Americans. The Gentlemen's Agreement that you'll hear called the Gentlemen's Agreement between Roosevelt and Japan in no way addressed the issue of anti-Asian sentiment among white Americans in the Western U.S. Moving back to the southeast of the U.S., to the Caribbean and Central and South America, T. Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy that you may have learned about could also just be called the bully approach. When describing his foreign policy, T. Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. Which, if you make it sound less of a quotable aphorism and just say what it means, sounds far less wise. Why bother negotiating with folks if you can just beat them up? This is incredibly obvious. When it came to negotiations for a strip of land in Central America so that the U.S. could build a canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific shipping ways. If you watched the coda on maps seemingly forever ago in a lecture or a while ago, you might remember the slide you're looking at now showing an 18th century fan advocating for the French to build a canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific sea routes. In fact, the French worked on the region of what is now Panama beginning in 1880. Plagued by design flaws, tropical diseases, and financial mismanagement, the French abandoned the canal project in 1893. T. Roosevelt felt like this would be a great project for Americans to succeed with, as it would be quite advantageous for shipping U.S. goods to markets, controlling everyone else's shipping, and as a nice bonus would also show up the French. Under T. Roosevelt, the U.S. offered Colombia $10 million for a strip of land to build the canal because at the time what is now Panama was part of Colombia. You can see this on maps in part one of this lecture, although I did not at the time draw attention to it. The Colombian Senate unanimously rejected the offer, objecting to the loss of sovereignty over the zone. T. Roosevelt was incensed and annoyed, and clutching his big bully stick, he considered having the U.S. invade Panama. But since he was such a fan of autonomous nations, and because war is expensive and lots of Americans did not want it, T. Roosevelt instead supported the Panamanians in a revolt against Colombia. Two weeks after the U.S. officially recognized the Republic of Panama, T. Roosevelt had his canal zone, although the project would not be completed until 1914 during Woodrow Wilson's presidency. But I hear some people say T. Roosevelt was a conservationist. He set aside national parks. He oversaw the 1905 Forest Transfer Act that gave the National Forest Service, headed by Gifford Pinchot, supervision over 150 million acres of federal land. Now, Pinchot, a close personal friend of Roosevelt's, urged that federal lands be opened for ranchers and timber companies, so long as their management resulted in, quote, sustained yield. I mean, if T. Roosevelt were looking for stewards of the land, there were still Native Americans around who had managed the land for a while. Of course, not necessarily the land that T. Roosevelt wanted kept so that he could go big game hunting. In fact, T. Roosevelt said, quote, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indian is the dead Indian. But I believe nine out of every ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the ten. The most vicious cowboy has more moral principle than the average Indian. T. Roosevelt actually backed removing Native Americans from 86 million acres that various groups still had, and transferring that land to the national forest system. Same with the national parks. Any Native Americans on them had to move, either leaving or consolidating in ever smaller spaces. 
Well, but T. Roosevelt was hard on monopolies in the railroads, right? There was that one time when he stopped a big railroad merger and won a Sherman antitrust case. True enough. But he also believed that interstate railroads needed actions like pooling so that they could control rates. He made a law out of his one Sherman Trust prosecution, but he was not against corporate mergers. He just thought that companies should have to get permission from him first. In 1903, he created the Department of Commerce and Labor and within it, the Bureau of Corporations. In return for assurance that they would be responsible, Roosevelt personally granted consolidated firms immunity from antitrust prosecution, U.S. Steel, Standard Oil, and International Harvester all took advantage of this deal and agreed to behave responsibly, although that was a rather ill-defined quality. Federal bureaucracy was growing with the addition of new departments, something that the large middle-class white voting bloc favored, but there was still no federal or central bank. The 1906 earthquake and fire in San Francisco forced insurance companies to pay out big, leaving a shortfall of money in the East and leading to the Panic of 1907. J.P. Morgan stepped in to rescue banks again. This time, in return, he got a personal guarantee from T. Roosevelt to give antitrust immunity to U.S. Steel if that firm were to purchase a company held by one of the foundering banks. In the presidential election of 1908, William Jennings Bryan ran yet again on the Democratic ticket. By that time, the Democratic Party had poached many of the demands of the populist party, like income tax and eight-hour workday, but in watered-down versions. T. Roosevelt decided not to run in 1908 and backed the Republican candidate Taft, whom you may recognize as the former overlord of the Philippines for the U.S., T. Roosevelt would retract his support before the next election, but in 1908, he stood behind Taft. Taft won, with Bryan carrying only the Solid South as the Democratic Party choice and the silver mining states. Taft angered Roosevelt by bringing charges against U.S. Steel for violating antitrust laws. You may remember that Morgan had made an agreement with T. Roosevelt when he bailed out the banks in 1907, granting U.S. Steel immunity from prosecution. Taft was not impressed. He did suggest that Morgan had misled T. Roosevelt, which left T. Roosevelt either looking like a gullible idiot who was fooled or a pal of big money, which he was, but having that be seen rather ruined his whole man of the people image. We've seen before that T. Roosevelt could be petty when crossed, and he was exceedingly angry with Taft, which we will see in the next presidential election. The cartoons here are mocking the fact that T. Roosevelt expected Taft to be his flunky and that Taft had his own ideas. You can see on the right, Taft is cleaning house, being the White House in this case, giving back T. Roosevelt's metaphorical baby, his policies, and the porter on the left is carrying away the big stick. Taft was not a great friend of the populace. He was generally pro-business, and in a quick class like this, there's nothing that really stands out about Taft's presidency. He went on being big business and maintaining but not enlarging American empire. On the ground, though, actual progressives, not the top-down image progressives, were working hard at the state level and below, as we have seen in earlier lectures. Most of the excitement concerning Taft came in the 1912 elections. Roosevelt, annoyed, went up against Taft for the Republican nomination, but the Republican Party chose to stay with Taft as their candidate. You can see the overwhelming enthusiasm of his party, though, with the slogan on the right, President Taft. He's 
all right, T. Roosevelt supporters went off and formed the so-called Progressive Party. T. Roosevelt himself had just survived an assassination attempt, but showed up at the convention nominating him, saying that he was as fit as a bull moose to run for president. One wonders what a moose would need to do to be ready to run for U.S. presidency, but of course, to T. Roosevelt, the bull moose was one of the symbols of rugged masculinity. You will often hear the Progressive Party referred to as the bull moose party. Roosevelt ran on what he called the new nationalism and the square deal. I put the last lines of the new national nationalism speech on the slide. This is the last part of the speech. We must have the right kind of character, character that makes a man. First of all, a good man in the home, a good father and a good husband. That makes a man a good neighbor. You must have that. And then in addition, you must have the kind of law and the kind of administration of the law, which will give to those qualities in the private citizen the best possible chance for development. The prime problem of our nation is to get the right type of good citizenship, and to get it, we must have progress, and our public men must be genuinely progressive. So he's throwing that word around. The Democrats, you may recall, had run William Jennings Bryan in the last three presidential elections and lost with him. In 1912, they went with Woodrow Wilson who was the son of a Presbyterian minister and had grown up in Virginia and Georgia, getting credibility from that with the solid South. As a career, he had been the president of Princeton University and then governor of New Jersey, giving him appeal to the educated elite. Bryan supported Wilson, and Wilson worked with Boston lawyer and social reformer Louis Brandeis on his campaign. If you've been to live lectures, yes, that is the Brandeis of the Brandeis brief. On the advice, advice of Brandeis, Wilson countered T. Roosevelt's new nationalism with what his campaign called new freedom, basically absorbing and updating the democratic version of what had been the populist, not progressive, but populist with the Omaha platform demands. This included a policy of breaking up monopolies, creating a publicly accountable banking system rather than the J.P. Morgan bail us out behind the scenes system, and regulations placed on railroads to help farmers and small shippers. Wilson's campaign also pointed out that T. Roosevelt was not for breaking up monopolies, but for having bureaucratically managed monopolies approved personally by T. Roosevelt. Wilson managed to blend appeal to the South, parts of the North, and the agrarian West. And as you can see from the election map, he won the 1912 presidential election hands down. Democrats also emerged from the 1912 election with majority control in both the Senate and the House of Representatives, and a sense that they had a mandate from the voters to really rein in big business and prioritize the working as well as the middle classes. This would not be just or even primarily a Wilson top-down approach, but would really show the results of progressive activism that had been going on for the entire era of Module C. Right away in 1912, Congress set up a committee to investigate the money trust. In other words, the power of wealthy individuals to control banking. The committee told Americans what many of them already believed, that a small group of bankers linked to J.P. Morgan controlled enough manufacturing and transportation companies to pretty much run the country. The Federal Reserve Act created the Federal Reserve Board. The seven members of the board would be nominated by the president, but then confirmed by the Senate. There would also be 12 Federal Reserve Banks, each with its own board of directors. All nationally recognized banks were required to buy stock in and deposit reserves with their regional reserve bank. Reserve 
banks would then lend money to member banks according to rules set up by the Federal Reserve Board to avoid the sort of runs on banks and busts seen in the 19th century and in 1907. The 16th Amendment, ratified by the states in 1913, created a federal income tax to fund government. You may recall that one of the planks of the 1892 Omaha platform of the populace was graduated income tax. Two other planks in the Omaha platform had been the secret ballot and the direct election of senators. The secret ballot had been adopted at the level of the states by the beginning of the 20th century. The 17th Amendment, ratified in 1913, moved the right to elect U.S. senators from state legislators to the individual voters. Congress passed and Wilson signed legislation that progressives had been seeking for decades. I've listed a handful here. I'm not going to read through them. So if you want to, to read them, you'll need to look at the slide. On the other hand, Wilson accepted a doubling down on racism at the federal level. Black employees in federal departments were relegated to separate or screened off work areas, as well as segregated bathrooms and cafeterias. Somehow it was okay with racist white Americans to have black people do the work of preparing their food, but it wasn't okay to have black people sit next to them to eat. In addition to physical separation from white workers under Wilson, black employees were only accepted in menial positions and those people already in federal jobs were reassigned to divisions slated for elimination, meaning they'd lose their jobs. The federal government began requiring photographs on civil service applications to better enable racial screening, as if Homer Plessy and his group of activists had not already demonstrated the complete irrationality of such a practice. Wilson actually harked back to the majority opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson that segregation only disadvantaged Black people because they felt like it did. Just think happy thoughts, folks, and it will actually not be okay, but I'll feel better about doing something patently wrong. As President Woodrow Wilson said, the force of America is the force of moral principle, and we will see that in his presidencies coming up. The problem with those sentiments, as we've seen with industry bosses and previous presidents, is that well-off white Americans felt like they were the only ones to have a say in what was and was not moral. I am not going to weigh in on Mexican politics in the early 20th century, but point out cases where Wilson decided for everyone what was and was not moral when it came to U.S. interactions with Mexico. Wilson refused to recognize Huerta's government, considering it illegitimate because it was gained through force. But when diplomatic meddling in Mexico failed to overthrow Huerta, Wilson okayed sending the U.S. Navy to patrol Mexico's coast, looking for reasons to interfere with force. Without confirming the news, when Wilson heard that Germany might be sending arms to Mexico, he ordered, he, Wilson, ordered U.S. ships to bombard Veracruz Harbor, and he sent 800 U.S. Marines into the Mexican city. In 1916, Wilson sent General Pershing and 7,000 U.S. troops into Mexico to hunt for Pancho Villa. But the American government's attention, including Wilson's, were steadily drawn away from Mexico. 
to other parts of the world. By 1914, power struggles among the world's empires had already begun to coalesce into what would later be called World War I, although since no one was planning on a World War II at the time, it was just called the Great War. The map on this slide shows where things stood with many of the major empires in 1914 around the Mediterranean. So France here, you can see has big parts of North Africa. Britain controls Egypt over here, a little bit over here, and we know down here into South Asia. The Ottoman Empire, which many Americans tend to forget about, but is actually rather an important region, and the Russian Empire, as well as the Austria-Hungarian Empire, were pushing for control of various regions. In the next mini module, I am going to focus on how the Great War affected events within the United States. Remember that big American companies and wealthy individuals, as well as the US economy overall, had been linked to Europe's banks and economy for at least half a century. Panics like those of 1873 and 1893 affecting both sides of the Atlantic were only a foreshadowing of how that tight linkage would affect the U.S. going forward. He points to Lecture 13. During the presidential terms of Rutherford B. Hayes to Grover Cleveland's second term, 1877 to 1897, Politicians, not just presidents, but legislators and jurors as well, were of the same class and society as big business owners. Government during the 1877 to 1897 period generally took a laissez-faire approach to banking, economy, and business, meaning that there was minimal government oversight or regulation for any of these. Most voters chose candidates by party loyalty or standing decision. In general, during the 1877 to 1897 period, Republicans favored big business and money interests, largely in the Northeastern and Great Lakes region of the U.S., Protestant moral reformers, anti-vice candidates, and voters were usually Republicans. Democrats held the white solid South, using the suppression of Black votes. Catholic immigrants in the industrial urban centers of the North also favored Democrats. Neither Republicans nor Democrats of the era, again 1877 to 1897, paid much attention to the needs of small business, labor, and especially farming in the Western U.S. In order to protect themselves from unscrupulous lenders and railroad big agriculture partnerships, farmers began to form co-ops, pooling resources and crops so that together they could function as a larger business entity. The People's or Populist Party developed out of groups of industrial workers and Western farmers. In the 1892 Omaha platform, this group outlined their political demands, including income tax, secret ballot, direct election of senators, increased availability of hard money outside of the upper classes in the eastern U.S., federal regulation of basic services like railroads, an eight-hour workday, and broad immigration restrictions. J.P. Morgan stepped in to bail out banks and federal government to end the Panic of 1893. He made more money in the long run by doing so and demonstrated the degree of wealth and power in the hands of the ultra-elite. By McKinley's presidency, 1897 to 1901, U.S. business interests had spread well beyond the boundaries of the United States into places like Central America, Cuba, and Hawaii, where they exercised increasing power and control. Great Britain had the world's most powerful navy. The navies of the colonial powers of France and Russia were smaller, but also well-established. Germany, Japan, and the U.S. began developing extensive navies. 
the Spanish Navy had decreased in power and a desire to protect business interests combined with opportunity and the pressure of yellow journalism led the U.S. to declare war on Spain, supposedly for the sake of Cuba. Anti-imperialists in the U.S. managed the Teller Amendment, which stated that the U.S. would not annex Cuba. At the end of the Spanish-American War, the U.S. gained Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines over the objections of the Filipinos, resulting in the bloody Philippine-American War. The U.S. did not fully annex Cuba, but did maintain a permanent base at Guantanamo. Theodore Roosevelt used the Spanish-American War to carefully craft and publicize his image of rugged masculinity shaped by American frontier mythology. During Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, he successfully projected a veneer of popular concern while remaining a member of the ultra-rich. Roosevelt favored making personal agreements with big business leaders as a form of top-down progressivism. This included gentlemen's handshake agreements with the owners of U.S. Steel, Standard Oil, and International Harvester. It also included a deal with J.P. Morgan to bail out banks in the Panic of 1907 in return for immunity from antitrust laws. The gentleman's agreement with the government of Japan to limit the movement of working-class Japanese into the U.S. fit into this pattern. When it came to domestic and foreign policy, Theodore Roosevelt was a believer in the superiority of white English-speaking civilization and eugenics. This meant that T. Roosevelt helped with a political coup in Panama against Colombia in order to gain U.S. rights to the Panama Canal Zone. T. Roosevelt held on to the Philippines because of their strategic location with respect to Far Eastern markets for U.S. goods especially in the case of China. And T. Roosevelt also authorized TAF to conduct behind-the-scenes diplomacy with Japan. In the treaty brokered by Theodore Roosevelt to end the Russo-Japanese War, Japan was enabled to take over Korea and tacitly agreed not to challenge U.S. interests in the Philippines. Woodrow Wilson's presidency saw the passage of progressive legislation. This had less to do with Wilson himself than with four decades of progressive pressure from below that we've been talking about over a number of lectures now. The Democratic Party absorbed versions of the populist demands in the Omaha Platform of 1892, things like the 16th and 17th Amendments, banking oversight, eight-hour day. The growth of the federal government and professional middle-class civil service normalized, adding federal oversight bodies and enlarging bureaucratic organization. Woodrow Wilson backed segregation in the federal civil service that resulted in fewer and lower paying, lower status jobs for Black Americans. Short but relevant coda for this lecture. When I mentioned Eugene B. Debs in connection with the American Railway Union or ARU and the Pullman strike, I said that I would come back to him. But then I ended up editing him out of lecture 13 here. Debs ran for U.S. president in 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920. In the 1912 election, covered in part two of lecture 13 here, he actually won 6% of the popular vote. When Debs ran in 1920, he won 915,000 votes, and he did this from prison. He had criticized the use of the 1917 Wartime Espionage Act, that we'll get to later, to target labor rather than spies.